got your Bibles, 1 Corinthians chapter number 5. While you're turning there, uh, children, you are dismissed. I want to read a card from uh, Debbie Burchette. I want to thank my wonderful church family for the love and support during David's illness and death to those who called, brought food, sent cards and gifts. I thank each of and every one of you. I also want to thank those hardworking guys who graciously took time out of their lives to cut, split, and deliver and stack wood for me. I love and appreciate every one of you all and all that you have done. Uh, Debbie Burchette, I want to continue to remember uh, Miss Debbie, and uh, during, especially during Christmas time and others who have gone through difficult times in their life. I uh, had a funeral this past week for a two-day-old, one of my cousin's uh, children, and I know for them and others, um, this is this incredibly difficult, especially this time of the year, to walk through those waters, so we want to be remembering those. Don't, don't get so caught up in what's going on with you that you forget to look at others. There are many who are hurting. Uh, this morning, I want to uh, begin uh, a, a little mini-series, I guess, if you will, that we'll kind of walk through over the next three or four weeks, uh, talking uh, about a, a message title, What's Next? You know, what, what's next in life? I think that's really a question that we should uh, we should ask ourselves from time to time. You know, here we are, we've come to the conclusion or nearly the conclusion of 2015. What's, what's around the corner? Uh, Lord, what, what's, what, what do you have in mind for me personally? Uh, what do you have in mind for our church corporately? When you, when you look at our world and our culture, you, you look at, uh, in particular, the nation in which we live, you look at 2015 and and as I begin to think about this, I see some markers uh, in, in America that are, that are quite disturbing when you look back at 2015, to be very honest. That's not to say there haven't been good things that have happened, but there are a number of markers that should cause us some real concern. Uh, we have in many states now legalized marijuana. Uh, we've seen the wholesale slaughter of Christians uh, by ISIS and other terrorist organizations. We've applauded this past year uh, transgendered sex change as a culture. That doesn't mean we have individually, but as a culture, certainly it's been applauded. We've turned the other way, seemingly, uh, as aborted baby body parts were sold by Planned Parenthood. Uh, that seemingly came and went and, uh, you know, let's just, let's just slap them on the hand. Let's not hold them responsible. And, uh, and our culture seems to be fine and okay with that. As followers of Jesus Christ, as adherents to what we know God's Word says, uh, for those of us who believe that life begins at conception, that should cause us to be outraged. But that has taken place, and that's something that took place in 2015. There was the Paris and the San Bernardino attacks. Uh, we signed a nuclear deal, which I believe uh, to be quite ironic that we signed a nuclear deal with someone that we consider to be a terrorist state. Uh, that, that should, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out that that should raise a red flag in your, in your mind, both historically and politically, and globally, that we signed a nuclear deal with a terrorist state. And in doing so, if you read that uh, nuclear deal very carefully, we, in essence, turned our back again on Israel. And that should cause us great concern. As you look across our nation, we still aborted over one million 70,000 children in America in 2015. And that clock is still counting, by the way, because we've yet a little less than a week to go. 588,000 people died as a result of heart disease, 570,000 because of cancer, 200 some thousand because of medical errors, and the list goes on and on of the things that have taken place in 2015. Again, that's not to say that there haven't been good things that haven't taken place in our world, in our culture, and here in the United States. When I think about uh, Ebenezer Baptist Church and, and we look at where we've come over the past year, we began 2015 celebrating the fact that we paid off our church mortgage. 
I mean, that, that, is, that is astounding. That's, that's incredible when you look and you see what God has done for us. Over $150,000 uh, we gave and or to support missions or sending teams to travel missionally in 2015. We had over 1,500 who attended our local men's, women's, couples, and youth events. We distributed over 25,000 pieces of gospel literature and tracts over this past year. We had over 200 uh, visits that were made just by our faith teams alone over 24 weeks. Our mission teams traveled over 146,000 miles nationally and around the world to take the gospel. We sent over 600 Christmas Operation Christmas Child boxes to children around the world. We supplied Christmas for uh, 35 families, for 70 children uh, this last week. And as a result of that, one young man, one 12-year-old young man last week gave his heart to the Lord Jesus Christ. And that, that's something in which we should rejoice. We've aired either on local radio or via the, inter, the internet and the web, we've aired over 150 hours of the gospel message being given from right here in Maxville. I mean, we're in the middle of nowhere, if you haven't figured that out, all right? And we have the privilege of taking the gospel message, and literally every week it's going global. And for those that are listening via uh, the World Wide Web this morning, thank you for tuning in and listening. It's a privilege for us to be wherever you may be in the world. Over 10,000 hours spent in Sunday school classes and small group Bible studies. That's not to mention at least the 2,000 plus hours over this past year that teachers have spent in preparation. 300 hours were volunteered by nursery workers this past year. That's a lot. They should be given uh, at least a gold crown for that, all right? And if you've ever worked in the nursery, that's, that's incredible. 200 children average at our VBS, 70 volunteers, Thanksgiving baskets, food pantry, our choir, spent countless hours in preparation and singing. Uh, those who serve in our sound and audiovisual ministry, our worship team, our drama ministry, what we do at Hawking College, the guys who right now, some are out in the parking lot making sure that your vehicles are secure. Uh, you may not realize that and know that, but we have security and uh, because we're watching out for you. So when you see one of those guys in a yellow vest, tell them thank you. Uh, for what they're doing and, and sacrificing their time. Our greeters, uh, prayer shawls that are given out, backpacks of hope that are delivered uh, to schools and school children. And the list goes on and on of what God has been doing in and through uh, Ebenezer Baptist Church and through you as individuals. And so the question is, what next? That's a logical question that I believe we need to answer. And in 2 Corinthians chapter number 5, I want to read this chapter. We're not going to unpackage it this morning. We will do more of that next week. But I want to read it because I believe because of the fact of what we have coming. As we read uh, earlier uh, in, in our passage in 1 Corinthians 15, because of what's to come, there is still work to be done. And that should be a motivating force behind us. But listen to what Paul writes in 2 Corinthians chapter number 5. For we know that our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved. We have a building of God and house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this we groan, earnestly, de earnestly desiring to be clothed upon with our house which is from heaven. In other words, as believers, we have a desire to put on a new set of clothes. Now, when I say a new set of clothes, I'm not talking about the threads that you're wearing on your physical body. I'm talking about a, literally a new body that you're going to receive when you are glorified at the return of Jesus Christ. And I don't know about you, but I am looking forward to that day. That's why Paul said we groan earnestly. As a matter of fact, Paul says in Romans that, that even creation groans for that moment because creation has been cursed by the fall of man. But the good news is Jesus didn't come to die for creation. He came to die for us as human beings. If so be that being clothed, we shall not be found naked. For we that are in this tabernacle do groan, being burdened not for that we would be unclothed, but clothed upon 
that mortality might be swallowed up of life. Now he that hath wrought us for the selfsame thing is God, who hath given unto us the earnest of the Spirit, which, by the way, is a fascinating concept. That word earnest literally means down payment. So guess what we have? We have been given not only life eternal because of what Christ has done for us on the cross, and Jesus said what in John? He said, I'm not going to leave you comfortless, but I'm going to give you the Spirit of God who will be your comforter. And not only that, but the Spirit of God is, if you will, for us, earnest money. Now, I don't know if you've ever gone through a real estate transaction or not, but you give earnest money, and that earnest money holds the deal for you, right? Do you, you understand the concept? The Holy Spirit has been given to us by God, and He is the one that holds the deal for us, knowing that we have been redeemed. That's the earnest of the Spirit. Therefore, we are always confident, knowing that while we are at home in the body, we're absent from the Lord. For we walk by faith and not by sight. We are confident, I say, willing rather to be absent from the body and present with the Lord. Wherefore, as a result of we labor, that whether present or absent, we may be accepted of him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of God. Listen, we're all going to stand before God giving an account one day that everyone that receives the things done in his body according to that which he hath done, whether it be good or bad. Now, that, by the way, is not the great white throne judgment that you see over in the book of Revelation. This is the judgment for believers and believers alone. Knowing, therefore, verse 11, the terror of the Lord, we persuade men, but we are made manifest unto God, and I trust also are made manifest in your consciences. For we commend not ourselves again unto you, but give you occasion to glory on our behalf that you may have somewhat to answer them which glory in appearance and not in heart. For whether we be beside ourselves, it's of God, or whether we be sober, it's for your cause. For the love of Christ constrains or controls us because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead, and that he died for all, and that we which live should not henceforth live unto themselves but unto him which died for them and rose again. Wherefore, henceforth, know we no man after the flesh, yea, though we have known Christ after the flesh, yet now henceforth know we him no more. Therefore, which by the way, just as a little, uh, a little added bonus here for studying purposes, whenever you see the word therefore, you should always look back and see what it's there for. So he says, therefore, do this. Why? because of what you just read. Therefore, as a result of all of that, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given unto us the ministry of reconciliation, to wit, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, which is incredible, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead be reconciled to God. For he hath made him, speaking of Christ, to be sin for us, who knew no sin, speaking of Christ, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. So as a result of all of those things, I believe uh, there are some things that we should consider. Now, like I said, next week we're going to unpackage that particular chapter in great detail, and we're going to examine three reasons uh, why I believe that we should reach, uh, and we'll talk about that in just a moment. So when you, when you ask the question, what next? I believe it's both a personal question and a corporate qu question. I believe when you ask the question next, it begs a look back, and I believe it begs a look forward. When you ask the question next, I believe it requires us to ask, do I need to make some adjustments in my life in respect to what I've been doing? And I believe the question, what's next, requires us to determine, do we stay the course in any area? As a church, there are a number of things in 2016 uh, that I'm excited about. Uh, there's, there's kind of three words that our leadership is going to hear about uh, in a couple of weeks when we have our leadership summit, and that's effective, efficient, and excellence. 
Those are three words that I'm really going to be focusing on in respect to our leadership and what I want to see us doing. I want us to be more effective in what God has called us to do. I want us to be more efficient in how we do it, and I want it to be done with excellence. I believe those are three incredibly important concepts, but in so doing, I want us to be energized by the Spirit of the living God. And so in 2016, we're going to focus on uh, communication better. Uh, In the spring, Lord willing, in March, uh, we are going to be uh, laying out and unveiling our long-range planning consultant will be here, Mr. Lawrence Corley. And in in the month of March, we're going to lay out the long-range a plan that we, we believe maybe God has for us in the future, what that looks like, uh, what that might mean in respect to, to uh, expansion of our facilities. Uh, we see maybe potentially two rather large expansions left yet here, and then I believe that will provide for us everything that we need to accomplish, uh, at least for the near future. So those are exciting things that we're looking forward to. But in respect to staying the course, I believe there's some things that undergird what we do that in order for us to remain biblical, we must stay true to them. First of all, I want you to, I want you to see this, and you're going to hear this several times repeated because I don't ever want there to be any mistake or misunderstanding in respect to what we believe God has called us to do. First of all, I want you to see our vision. This is our vision. Our stated vision is this, that we would grow a biblically sound, culturally relevant, loving body of believers who will have a passion to fulfill their ministry and mission so as to reach the 97,000 people in our Jerusalem within a 15-mile radius of our church, the surrounding counties, our state, nation, and world with the gospel of Jesus Christ. That is our vision. I believe that's a biblical vision or we wouldn't have it as our vision. Why? Because Mark 16, 15 says, go into all the world and do what? And preach the gospel to who? People you're most comfortable preaching it to? The ones who maybe won't reject you? No, preach the gospel to what creature? What is it, church? Every creature. Everyone needs to hear the gospel message. And again, uh, I've said this many, many times. I've said it probably more times than you want to hear, but I'll keep saying it. There are 97,000 people within a 15-mile radius of this church. That's a statistical fact, by the way. Those aren't just numbers we pull out of the air. But from a fi- in a 15-mile radius of this church, by the way, the crow flies, if you draw lines and you draw a big circle, uh, we've got that on a big map somewhere, there's 97,000 people. That means potentially, potentially, Uh, We could hear at Ebenezer Baptist Church, depending on where they're driving from. That's only 15 miles as the crow flies, which here in Hocking, Perry, and Vinton, and all those other counties, that might be 30 or 45 minutes, as you well know, all right? We don't live at at the corridor of a a four-lane place. But anyway, regardless of the fact, all right, we have a responsibility, first and foremost, to reach those 97,000 people. And by the way, they have not been reached yet. If they had been reached, then churches would be popping up everywhere within that 15-mile radius, and they would be jam-packed full this morning. But I'm here to tell you, they aren't, and they haven't. And so we've still got a job to do right here in our own Jerusalem. 97,000 people. Regionally, within the state of Ohio, there are 11.6 million people. Say, can can we effectively reach... Uh, the state of Ohio, I believe we have the tools and resources, not only individually, but as we partner with, especially with our 700 uh, sister churches, or Southern Baptist Church, or 700 Southern Baptist churches in the state of Ohio, but not only that, but we we partner with other churches here in our community and around the state to reach our state with the gospel of Jesus Christ. I can promise you this, 11.6 million people in the state of Ohio don't know Jesus Christ, and you would be shocked and amazed at the number of people who have never yet heard the gospel. It's it's astounding. Nationally, 319 million people. Globally, it's actually, as I looked this morning on the global time clock, as it it goes up every minute of every day, there are 7.3 billion people in the world. That is our focus, our vision, 
our focus. You say, well, what is our strategy? Our strategy is very simple. You heard us uh, uh, this past year in January, I think, we talked about it. The first part of our strategy is to reach because the Father sent the Son, reach others with the gospel of Jesus Christ by the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. Uh, we'll you hear more about that next week specifically as we unpackage 2 Corinthians chapter number 5. Secondly is to grow because the Father has instructed us we're to grow in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and being taught by the Holy Spirit. We're to serve because the Father sent the Son as an example. Serve in the body of Christ as we have been given gifts by the Holy Spirit. Listen, we've all been given gifts by the Holy Spirit if we know Him, and it's our responsibility and duty to serve, to be involved in ministry, not just show up on Sunday morning and do our Sunday morning thing and go home. No, but to serve. That's what He's called us to do and to worship. You see, I believe as an outgrowth, an expression of everything that He has done for us and through us and will do for us and through us, we should be free in our expression of our worship towards Him. But I'm afraid sometimes we become so self-sufficient and complacent and respect to and apathetic in respect to our Christianity that really the outgrowth and expression of our worship is very weak. But it should be. Oh my goodness, everything that we do, whether, whether it's fellowshipping with one another or giving as we give, stewardship or singing and worshiping and, and, and music, all that we do should be with a heart of attitude, a worship, an attitude of worship in spirit and in truth. Well, we do things by Scripture alone. Scripture is our only standard, that sola scriptura. By Christ alone we are saved, that sola Christus. Salvation is by grace alone, that sola gratia. Uh, justification by faith alone, that sola fide. But everything that we do, solo deo gloria, for the glory of God. Everything that we do, we want to be done for the glory of God. Now take your Bibles to 1 Samuel chapter number 7. 1 Samuel 7. A familiar passage of Scripture if you have been around here long. But I believe as we, just for, just for a few minutes, take an honest inventory of where we are right now, uh, and we take a little look back, I believe this is a great place to start. So I understand uh, professional athletes, when they begin a, a new season or a new year, they often go back to their basics. They'll, they'll find a coach, uh, maybe a coach they've had for a long time. By the way, did you know that professional athletes, many of them have personal coaches? Uh, and what they often do at the beginning of a season or beginning of the year, they go back. Uh, I know golfers do. They'll go back and they'll, they'll go through every swing, every move, how to hold the club, all the way back to the basics because they know that if they have the basics right, the foundation is right, then the rest will go uh, much, much better. And so this morning, I want us to kind of go back, if you will, and take a look at a foundation uh, for Ebenezer Baptist Church in 1 Samuel chapter 7 and verse number 12. Then Samuel took a stone, and he set it between Mizpah and Shin, and called the name of it, what? Ebenezer, saying what? Hitherto, or to this point, here we are, we want, we want you to know that God has been our help. Let me ask you a question. Has God been your help? Think about, think about the times in your life when God has helped you. I'm not going to preach the message I did a year or so ago, but, but I do want to remind us. I'm reminding myself, by the way, as well. I think a, a lot of times we fail to to really set aside those moments or those times when God has done something for us and mark it. That's what they did. You read throughout the Old Testament. You'll find markers, stones that were set up. Sometimes they were altars. Sometimes they were just a stone, a significant stone. And they would set those because they wanted the generation coming behind them or they wanted the enemy to see, 
Look, this is the place where God did what he did that only God could do, and we don't want you to ever forget it. Question. How many times have we sat around our kitchen table or around our living room and uh, spent time talking with family or friends about, man, let me tell you about this time when God did something incredible. Now, we have a lot of conversations about a lot of things. Work, the new Christmas present we got, nothing wrong with that, but the fact that Ohio State's going to beat Notre Dame. I mean, we know all of that, all right? Those things, you know. But we have a lot of conversations, which, by the way, uh, for those of you who are Notre Dame fans, uh, Les Smathers, many of you know Les, tall Les, who's always a greeter, he actually had the audacity to wear a Notre Dame shirt to a Baptist church. I, I, just, I was shocked this morning when I saw it. When you see Les, you need to give him a hard time. But we have a lot of conversations about a lot of things. But... But what about those spiritual conversations? Talking about the things that God has done. Well, that's what Samuel did. And by the way, this was a significant occasion for the children of Israel. So let's back up a little bit and just unpackage that real quick. Like, but we've got to go back to chapter number 4. Chapter number 4. So let's take a, an honest inventory of where things are. For the children of Israel, this is where they were. The word of Samuel came to Israel. Now Israel went out against the Philistines in battle, which, by the way, the Philistines always represented the enemy. They were always one of the many uh, thorns in the, the side of the children of Israel. And they pitched beside Ebenezer, and the Philistines pitched at Apek. And the Philistines put themselves in array against Israel, and when they joined battle, Israel was smitten before the Philistines, and they slew the army in the field, about 4,000 men. It's a lot. And when the people came to the camp, the, elder of Israel, the elders of Israel said, Wherefore? Why? Why, why has the Lord smitten us today before the Philistines? Let, let's fetch the ark of the covenant of the Lord out of Shiloh unto us that when it cometh among us, it may save us out of the hand of our enemies. It's an interesting, that's an interesting statement. Now, now, granted, in the Old Testament, the Ark of the Covenant was where God dwelt. It, was a, it always indicated the presence of the Lord. The Ark of the Covenant was to be kept in the Holy of Holies, and, and any time the Ark was there, it was seen as the presence. The problem, however, as we continue reading this story... The problem was not the, necessarily the absence of the Ark of the Covenant, nor the absence of the presence of the Lord. The problem and the reason the children of Israel were in the trouble that they were in was because of their lack of obedience. Now, there's a whole other message for a whole other time, but I think it's one note that we should take notice of. You see, the problem in my life is never the lack of the presence of God. Because as a child of God, guess who dwells within me all the time? The living God in the person of the Holy Spirit. The problem that I have, I don't know about you, I'm talking about me this morning, right? The problem that I have is one of obedience. That's when trouble comes along. So with the children of Israel. And so they sought after the Ark of the Covenant, so the people went to Shiloh, verse 4, that they might bring thence the ark of the covenant of the Lord of hosts, which dwell between the cherubims, and the two sons of Eli, note, just make a little note here, it's a critical note, Hophni and Phinehas, just remember the, them, uh, because they were with the ark of the covenant of God. And when the ark of the covenant of the Lord came to the camp, all Israel shouted with a great shout so that the earth rang again. And when the Philistines heard the noise, they said, Whoa, what meaneth the noise of this great shot in the camp of the Hebrews? And they understood the ark of the Lord was in the, in the camp. And the Philistines were afraid, for they said, God has come into the camp. And they said, Woe unto us, for there hath not been such a thing before this. Woe unto us, who's going to deliver us out of the hand of these mighty gods? 
These are the gods that smote the Egyptians with the plagues in the wilderness. Even the Philistines knew of the power and the glory of God. Be strong and you know, make yourselves like men, you Philistines, that you may not be servants unto the Hebrews as they have been unto you. Quit yourselves like men and fight. So guess what happened? The Philistines fought and Israel was smitten and they fled every man into his tent and there was a great slaughter. For there fell of Israel that day 30,000. Now, do you understand? Do you get it? So, in those two battles, in a very short period of time, 34,000 were slaughtered. And the ark of God was taken, and the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, were slain. And there ran a man of Benjamin out of the army and came to Shiloh, and the same day with his clothes rent and with the earth upon his head. And when he came, lo, Eli sat upon a seat by the wayside watching, for his heart trembled for the ark of God. And when the man came to the city and, and told it, all the city cried out. And when Eli heard the noise of the crying, he said, What meaneth the noise of this tumult? And the man came in hastily and told Eli. Now Eli was ninety and eight years old, and his eyes were dim that he could not see. And the man said unto Eli, I am he that came out of the army, and I fled today out of the army and said, what, what there be done, my son? And the messenger answered and said, Israel has fled before the Philistines, there's been a great slaughter among the people, and your two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, are dead, and the ark of God is taken. And it came to pass, when he made mention of the ark of God, that he fell off the seat backward by the side of the gate. His neck broke, and he died, for he was an old man and fat. And he had judged Israel 40 years. You know, that's a I don't know all the details about Eli's life. I don't know why his two sons, which, by the way, were not obedient to the Lord. But, you know, that, that's a sad, sad epitaph and eulogy at the end of one's life, is it not? Your children are not following the Lord. You're old. You can't see. You're fat. You fell off a stump and broke your neck and you died. That's, 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 a, that's a really sad commentary to me. Again, I, I don't know all about Eli. I, I, I really, because Scripture doesn't tell us necessarily all the details of why his sons failed. And his daughter-in-law, Phineas' wife, was with child, near to be delivered. And when she heard the tidings that the ark of God was taken and that her father-in-law and her husband were dead, she bowed herself and travailed, for her pains came upon her. And about the time of her death, the woman that stood by her said unto her, Fear not, for you've got a son. But she didn't answer them. Neither did she regard it. And so this handmaid who was with her, she named the child, what's the, what's the child's name? Ichabod. saying, The glory is departed from Israel because the ark of God was taken and because of her father-in-law and her husband. And she said again, The glory is departed from Israel for the ark of God is taken. For the children of Israel, this was a really dark moment. When you, look, when you take an inventory of where they were, what, what a place to be in. The glory of God was departed. The, the, the child that was born would have been really a rightful uh, heir, if you will, to the priesthood. And yet the child's name was Ichabod? Can you imagine walking around with the name Ichabod? Knowing that your name means the glory of God is gone. You know, this really is a, a story that's indicative of one that I believe is prevalent in our culture today. Do you know why they got to this point? Sure, because of their disobedience. We, we know that. But you, but you know why? Because of failed male leadership. Let me just speak to the men and the guys just for a moment. This is not, by the way, guys, you know, let's beat our chest and 
show our dominance because we're better than women. That's not the point at all. The problem in cultures, the problem in biblical examples over and over again, and the problem in our modern day culture today, you know why we're in the trouble we're, we're in as a nation? Who are we going to blame, guys? We're we going to blame our wives, the women, the women livers? No. The problem has always been a man problem. Now, if you ask your wife, she'll tell you it's okay to say amen, all right? If you just that's, that's always been the problem. Because, because as men, we're not strong enough, we don't have enough spiritual gumption about us to stand up and say, this is wrong, this is right, this is the way we're going to go. Well, for the children of Israel, it was no different. And as a result, the enemy had prevailed, as we said earlier. Some 34,000 were killed. This was, this was a tough, tough place. The glory of the Lord had departed. Maybe a personal question for you to answer this morning. What's, what's the Philistine in your life? You got a, got a Philistine in your life right now? Well, the story doesn't end there for which we should be grateful. Go to chapter number 7. E- even, though, even though it's a dark moment, a dark time, a dark place, they've been disobedient, the enemy has brought about destruction, there's been huge leadership vacuum on the part of the men. Don't ever, don't ever let failures or the enemy keep you from striving to please God. Let me say that one more time. Don't ever let your failures or the enemy keep you from striving to please God. Chapter 7, verse 1, And the men of kerjath Jerim came and fetched up the ark of the Lord and brought it to the house of Abinadab in the hill and sanctified Eliezer his son to keep the ark of the Lord. And it came to pass while the ark abode at kerjath Jerim that the time was long, for it was twenty years, and all the house of Israel lamented after the Lord. And Samuel spake unto the house of Israel, saying, If you do return unto the Lord with all of your hearts, Then put away the strange gods and Ashtaroth from among you and prepare your hearts unto the Lord and serve him only and he will deliver you out of the hand of the Philistines. That's why I could say with great confidence earlier the problem was not the presence of the Lord. The problem was one of disobedience. Because Samuel reminded the children of Israel, listen, you need to put away the junk and the garbage in your life that's not in line with being obedient to the living God. That means it requires action on our part. Now, that's not to say that we muster up all of this strength and energy and we do it all on our own. No, because we don't have to do it alone because we have the living God via the spirit of the living God within us who will enable us and help us to do the things that are right. We just have to be willing to surrender to do what's right. My problem is, I don't like to do what's right sometimes. Do you? Really? I'm the only one here? How many of you honestly would have to say there's times that I don't want to do what's right? Okay, thank you. I thought I was like, I was like the miserable preacher, wretched, and I'm the only one in the crowd. No, no Absolutely. And so Samuel says, listen, just do what's right. Do the right thing. And God will come along and he will deliver you as he has done over and over and over again in spite of your failures and in spite of the enemy. Wow. I ought to make somebody say amen, hallelujah. Then the children of Israel did. They put away Balaam and Asheroth. And, oh, just do a study on those two gods alone. It, it's, it's, whew. Incredible what they were what they were worshiping. Oh my goodness. They were worshiping 
these fertility gods uh, who engaged in these sexual orgies and prostitution and then they would turn around and sacrifice these prostitute children to to the god Baal I mean it's 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 incredible what they were doing and Samuel said gather all of Israel to Mizpah and I will pray for you unto the Lord and they gathered together to Mizpah to draw water and poured it out before the Lord and fasted on that day verse 6 and said we have sinned against the Lord and Samuel judged the children of Israel I'm reminded of that passage we read earlier back in 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 9. Paul said, and, and as he said to the Corinthians, he said, listen, as a result of the fact that we are living in immortality, as a result of that, we should strive to please God. Man, this, that should be what we strive to do all the time. And again, Samuel is, is reminding the children of Israel to do that very thing. But remember this, remember this. In the midst and the wake of repentance, don't ever think for a moment that the enemy is going to leave you alone. Don't think just because you're striving to please God and you're desiring to be obedient to God that the enemy is going to roll over and play dead because the enemy never will. And the Philistines, verse 7, heard the children of Israel were gathered together in Mizpah. The lords of the Philistines went up against Israel. And when the children of Israel heard it, they were afraid of the Philistines. And the children of Israel said to Samuel, Cease not to cry out to the Lord for us, that he will save us out of the hand of the Philistines. I want to say back to the children of Israel, Cry out to the Lord yourself! By the way, that's just another little freebie on the side. You don't need the preacher to pray for you. Now, I will pray for you. Don't make any mistake. But listen, I, I have no better access to God than you do. I mean, that, that you got to be grateful for that. You, you can talk to God and ask him about anything, anytime, place, anywhere. Now, if you come to me and say, don't, that doesn't mean don't you stop coming to me and say, hey, Pastor, would you pray? Oh, absolutely, I'll pray for you. But my prayers are no better than your prayers because we are on all on equal footing before the living God. Well, anyway, sorry, that was a little sideline freebie, all right? And Samuel took a suckling lamb and offered for a burnt offering holy unto the Lord, and Samuel cried to the Lord of Israel, and the Lord heard him. And Samuel, as, as Samuel was offering up the burnt offering, the Philistines drew near to the battle against Israel, but the Lord thundered with a great thunder. I wonder what that was like. I mean, you're talking about thousands now. Now, this, this would have been an army of thousands because, remember, earlier they killed 34,000 of the children of Israel. So this was armies of thousands. If you've ever watched Lord of the Rings, uh, that, that's, a, that's a great depiction of evil uh, against good. J.R.R. Tolkien, those were, those were brilliant uh, books that were written. And, and that, you almost get an ancient picture of what it would have been like on a battlefield not in modern warfare, but in ancient, ancient warfare when those, those battles would have taken place and they would have put themselves, as the King James says, in array, one against the other, on one hillside against the other, and they were literally just like ants moved. And this slaughter on the battlefield. That, that's the, kind of the picture. But at this particular moment, God thundered. I don't know what that means. I don't know how he did it, but he thundered. Listen to me. When God thunders, you can be sure of this. The enemy will flee. And the Lord thundered with a great thunder on that day upon the Philistines and discomfited them, and they were smitten before Israel. And the men of Israel went out of Mizpah and pursued the Philistines and smote them until they came to Bethkar. Then... Then what? Samuel took a stone and he set it in place. And he said, God has been our help. In spite 
of our failures of the past, in spite of what the future may look like, I want you to know at this moment, at this time, in this place, God helped us. Wow. Do you have any of those places in your life where God has been your help? Have you marked them? Are, are you thankful for those times? As, as we ask the question, what next? I don't know what next is for me necessarily individually. I don't necessarily know all the details of what's next for us as a church. I think there's exciting things yet to come. But I'm here to tell you, it's the same God yesterday, today, and forever. He helped us then. He'll help us again. Father, in the name of Jesus, oh God, I pray that we would be grateful for the times that you have helped. With your heads bowed and your eyes closed, I'm just going to ask you to quietly stand to your feet. And this is how I would ask you to respond this morning. If this morning you are, are so moved by the Spirit of God, and only by the Spirit of God, not by the voice of this preacher or anything else. And there's been some times in your life, maybe you've failed to mark them, or maybe you have marked them, but this morning you just want to come and get on your face humbly before a living God and say, oh God, thank you for those times in my life when you were my help. I don't know what next is, but God, I know you've helped me in the past and I know you'll help me again in the future. Again, we want to thank you for listening to this message from the Ebenezer Baptist Church. If you would like other messages or just general information about the Ebenezer Baptist Church, you can connect with us again on Facebook or on the web at www.ebc1837.com or you can call the church office at 740-385-8411.